Our next speaker is also new to the scientific symposium. Having shared the symposium with only one other female, the wonderful Marta Elders, I am very happy to welcome Judy Martin <laughs> and not be the lone female in it for, uh, for this. Uh, today, Jenny is going to speak to us on the title of her, her talk is Science and Thought Adjuster Fusion. Uh, Jenny, the platform is now yours. Thank you so much, Margie. It's wonderful to be here. Okay, so this is the portion of the Arantia book that I'm covering in my presentation. It's from paper 110, and I'll just read this briefly. This adjuster fusion during physical life instantly consumes the material body. The human being who might otherwise who might witness such a spectacle would only observe the translating mortal disappear in chariots of fire. Now I am going to look at how torsion physics provides a possible explanation for this phenomenon of a just refusion on Urantia in physical form. But before we unpack that big topic, we're gonna to start with human biology. And this I'm gonna to read to you from biologist, Dr. Mei Wan Ho. It's covered in her book, The Rainbow and the Worm, The Physics of Organisms. And she says, our cells communicate by exchanging information transmitted by low intensity light called biophotons. When a cell does not emit enough coherent biophotons, that cell becomes unhealthy. It's not able to share information with other cells very well. And without that exchange, it doesn't have what it needs. The mechanistic version of the inner workings of the cell that we learned in high school biology is dated. Attracting and repelling each other are not responsible for the way cells work. Instead, the biophotons that the cell emits and receives is the life force that governs those molecules. Now, Dr. Mei Wan Ho did not invent the term biophotons. We actually need to go back further in history to the 1930s and Russian scientist Alexander Gurvich, he was actually doing some experiments with onions and he found out that onions communicate with each other using weak light signals. He coined the term biophotons. Much later in the 1970s, German biophysicist Fritz Albert Popp provided experimental evidence of biophotons in the human body. He discovered that the DNA of the human body emits biophotons and they have a co coherent like property. Coherence in terms of light, we're talking about, for instance, laser. A laser light is highly coherent light. It has a certain order to it. Fritz Albert Popp was actually studying cancerous cells in the human body, and he found that the cancerous cells emitted a scrambled light. The light was disordered, as opposed to healthy cells where there was coherent light, and that's what began his discoveries. So this light within our body is not visible to the human eye, but with sensitive equipment, with sensitive cameras, it can be detected and the light within the human body can be photographed such as in this particular photograph here. What this tells us is that human beings are solid, are solid matter, but really if we zoomed in far enough, we are really made up of oscillating energy fields. I put this in the presentation to show that even though we don't necessarily learn about this in biology class, this information is being taken seriously for a long time by different governments. And this is a declassified document from, that was originated from the US Army and it became part of the CIA's documents. I discovered it on the Freedom of Information Act website, which the general public can look at documents that were once secretive intelligence briefings, but 
but then have become declassified, usually many, many decades later. In the case of this document, it was produced in 1983. It became declassified in 2003. This is a 63-page 63 63 document where they are considering putting people that work in the government through a process to access altered states to be able to do certain phenomena like remote viewing, to gain intelligence about military targets using only their consciousness, and other, quote, paranormal type activities. And they're considering a certain type of training process at the Monroe Institute. The particular commander that wrote this 60th page document, he was tasked with determining whether there is a scientific basis that human consciousness can do such bizarre things as remote viewing and other paranormal. By paranormal, we mean things that you would normally not think the human brain could do, things like telepathy, things like telekinesis and so forth, but could be possibly trained to enter an altered state to do that. So in order for him to provide the scientific backup for this possibility, he went on a journey which included such things as, I'm going to read a highlight from this document. It said, I found it necessary to delve into various sources uh, for further information concerning quantum mechanics in order to describe the, func the nature and functioning of human consciousness. He further uh, talks about at the bottom here where the highlight is, Finally, I again found it necessary to use physics to bring the whole phenomenon of out-of-body states into the language of physical science to remove the stigma of its occult connotations and put it in a, a frame of reference suited to objective assessment. This is another excerpt from the same intelligence briefing, and I just highlighted a couple of points here. He says that solid matter in the strict construction of the term simply does not exist. And down at the bottom here, he says, the point to me made here is that the entire human be being, brain, consciousness, and all that is, like the universe which surrounds him, is nothing more or less than extraordinary complex system of energy fields. So this is a document from the CIA. I have the uh, link there down at the bottom to for you to access it. What this whole process the CIA is talking about is can we intentionally use our consciousness to access these possibilities? And they they were validating that in that document. So for our purposes here, we're asking human will, intention can influence these oscillating energy fields. And this is a document from a physics journal. It is talking about, in, in Chinese medicine, a Tibetan healer actually is using a particular meditative process to alter this electromagnetic energy, this, these biophotons in the, in the human body of the patient because as Fritz Albert Pop found out, there's a different there's a different quality to the electromagnetic energy. It doesn't have the same level of coherence when there is disease in the body. And the job of the healer is to bring their highly coherent state to the diseased person and and causing healing in the person. And so this is an article discussing this in that. This particular journal article, they do have this image. It's a little hard to see, but I'll just explain it. There's the healer. He's wearing a white shirt, and he is focusing his energy on the patient who is laying down. You can see the top of the head of the patient. The healer has his hands on the patient, and the healer, you can see with the curling uh, photography, the healer's light is being emitted from his body to the patient. So the, pa the healer is using focused intention. And what happens here is there is a transfer of coherent biophotons from the healer to the patient. So we're talking here that human intention will can influence the, the biophotons in our body. And 
This image again is from the same paper. And what is being shown is there is an image of whiteness around the top of this man's head. And what this healer is doing is he's intentionally visualizing this light and it actually can be picked up with this photographic process that there is a concentration of biophotons above this man's head directly as a result of him using his imagination. This is an article from the Journal of Consciousness Exploration and Research from 2011. Basically, what they did in this experiment is they put people in a dark room and the only instruction was visualize white light. When the people visualized white light, they used a photomultiplier a scientific device to be able to measure the biophotons being emitted by the subject's bodies and the emission changed, altered as a result of them imagining white light. So increased photonic emissions as a re result of imagining white light in a dark room. So this uh, individual, Claude Swanson, he is an American uh, physicist, uh, educated at MIT and Princeton, did work at Cornell and Princeton in the design of superconducting plasma containment vessels for fusion energy systems. And then he did work in different government agencies. I bring him in because he was the one that I was inspired to go look in the Freedom of Information Act for this subject. He described that what he learned in MIT and Princeton was different than what he learned when he went to work on classified projects. When he worked, went to work for government classified projects, he realized there is mainstream physics and there is classified physics and they're different. And so that is what caused him once he left his government work to really search for this classified physics. And really the essence of it is torsion physics and most of this research actually has come out of Russia and uh, Claude Swanson has written a, uh, a number of books and so forth. One of the things that Claude Swanson speaks about in one of his books is that the research is that our DNA in our human body emits biophotons and when the DNA emits biophotons it almost always emits a torsional wave at the same time. Now, this is back to that CIA document. And interestingly enough, the CIA document is about consciousness, but they are also speaking about the universe as a whole, the cosmos. And what we see at the top of this diagram, this image is of space time, and it is showing this torsional energy out in the cosmos. At the bottom, we have the image of the spinning of the torus. The, the torsional field. And this relates to both in the cosmos and in our bodies. And so what we find is that these torsion fields really show up in the cosmos and the human body. This is again from the CIA document. And again, I have to mention, this is a document about the role of consciousness, but they are bringing in this torsional field that happens in the galaxies, in the uh, space-time itself, and that relating to our, us as uh, our consciousness as well. Now, when we're talking about the torsional field that is inside of our body, it also is outside of our body. It extends beyond our body. Claude Swanson has described this in detail in this paper, the torsion field and the aura. So you're familiar, most of us are familiar, familiar with the concept of the aura. When I grew up, it was saints had auras. Uh, very saintly people had this halo on top of their head, but the average person, they didn't necessarily have an aura. But what we know when we're looking at this science is we all have an aura. We can't see it but it is this torsional field that surrounds our body. There is measurement devices that have been um, developed in Russia 
to measure the torsional field around the body using gas discharge visualization technology. And this is from, actually it's from an athlete who underwent some particular healing process. And you see on the left-hand side, the image of his aura. And then you see before the healing process, and then you see how his uh, aura was restored afterwards. So the torsion field around the body has been uh, linked to immune health, psychological well-being. And in fact, using this GDV measurement device in Russia and certain countries in Eastern, A in Eastern Europe is used in health clinics in order to as a diagnostic device for the health of the individual. Now, this is just a brief overview in my paper that accompanies this presentation. I went into a little bit more detail, but just to touch on some of the key individuals who have brought us the information about torsion physics that we have today. By the way, let me just mention, if you go to Google, <laughs> if you go to YouTube, you type in torsion physics, you will be sadly disappointed. You will either see information that says it's debunked and it's not real, or you will see basically nothing. And it's important to remember this has been classified research. Most of the information that we have is from Russia. The only reason we have it is because there was a period of glasnost in Russian in history when there was a free flow of information out of the country. That has since ended. And there isn't, there's, I, there, there's, Claude Swanson talks about there's patents on torsion um, physics. There, there's many different, there's been decades of research in Russia, but it hasn't reached uh, the general public. Uh, there's one individual, Shifnov, who has working on his own, basically, and he has a, a website with many, many articles, scientific articles talking about his research. Anyway, so it starts off with a French mathematician named Cartan. Cartan developed the underlying math for torsion. He brought it to Einstein. He wanted Einstein to scientifically prove torsion. So they worked together, but they could not prove it experimentally. You will find many papers, however, on Einstein-Cartan theory, but Einstein abandoned it after a while because he couldn't prove it. Later on, we have Kozirev, a Russian astrophysicist, who was basically de developed this around physical objects, and it's a long process I won't get into right now. But Shifnov is a Russian physicist in 1988. He took where Cartan and Einstein left off. And what he did is he realized that the math that Cartan was providing to Einstein did, showed a weak effect for torsion. And so it wasn't going to show up experimentally. So Shifnov went to an Italian mathematician, Ricci, Ricci and was able to use Ricci's math and using a set of 44 equations, he was able to provide the first experimental evidence of torsion physics and that we have today. He has written a book on the physical vacuum. It has been sent to scientists all over the world. He's asked scientists to, uh, anyone who can refute my book on the physical vacuum, please tell me. And they haven't received that, uh, that critique as far as I understand. Uh, so fast forward to more recent, Swanson, the uh, American uh, physicist that I talked about, in 2010, he became very interested in how do we, how can we empower ourselves? How can human beings understand that this role of, con our role of consciousness in affecting the torsional field? Now, back to Shifnov, who I just mentioned, Shifnov's what has been the one that has provided experimental evidence of torsion physics. And in order to explain part of his theory, he has the seven, level, seven levels of reality. It starts off, interestingly enough, with the absolute. He likens this to God. There are no mathematical equations for this level. However, he does have mathematical equations to show 
why each of the other levels are in the position they are. He can prove the math for all of that. So below the absolute, we have the primary torsion field. Then we have the physical vacuum, elementary particles, gas, liquid, and solid. In one of his articles written in Russian on his website, shipnop.com, he goes into an explanation about the role of consciousness very briefly, having to do with the seven levels of reality. So he says that above the physical vacuum is the primary torsion field, which is the source of all physical fields. The role of consciousness applies as it is our awareness, where we place our attention, that permits us to experience different levels of reality. We have access to the higher realities by changing our frame of reference, our perception. I included this because Claude Swanson mentioned it in his book, and I feel inspired to do so. So this is from the popular movie, The Matrix, and it says the matrix is everywhere. It's all around us. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And Claude goes on to ask, could it be that our consciousness is able to affect physical reality and ultimately even choose among parallel possibilities? And the short answer, according to this physicist, Claude Swanson, is yes. So now we get into Swanson's synchronized universe model. And I'm just gonna read the slide to you. There are many parallel planes of reality. Through consciousness, the average person is synchronized to one of them at a time. Therefore, the things we see and experience are the events in that synchronized plane. It is possible to shift focus to another synchronized plane. And as we do, it becomes our reality. This is the way, this is, this is the real way consciousness affects quantum physics. He takes, uh, he challenges the notion that the observer effect really is the role of consciousness, because even though when the wave function collapse happens, there is a role of the observer, it's still a random result. It, it, the, the consciousness isn't affecting the particular outcome, but in this synchronized universe model, consciousness is actually affecting the outcome. This is a diagram from his book, and he suggesting that these are sheets of paper representing different dimensions in the synchronized universe model. So a synchronized universe, a single synchronized universe is represented by one sheet of paper in a stack. Each sheet has its own unique frequency synchronized motion of the electrons in that system. Other sheets represent parallel realities or other parallel dimensions, which may cohabit the same space and time and yet be unaware of one another. The model suggests how we can cross between such dimensions by altering the phase of one universe to allow coupling and cross over to one another. So let's go further into his model. So in his model, the, the observer can be co-creator of reality by shifting among parallel possibilities, which is the same idea that Shifnoff is suggesting as well. So as science studies individuals who are capable of controlling their, in, their state of inner coherence, who can manifest and cause such anomalous events, the role of consciousness should become clear. So in his book, life source, a scientific basis. Claude Swanson uh, provides uh, information, evidence of people in Chinese medicine, um, Qigong healers, distance healers, all sorts of different individuals who have done things that defy the current laws of physics. And he says, as we study these individuals that can do these extraordinary things, we can then and seek to understand more about how, what the science behind it is. So this is a, a diagram from his book and it's showing the human in the, in the middle, the, the man there, 
with his focused intention, sending that out, and then the circle around it is distant matter. And when he sends out his his focused intention, his torsional field extends beyond him, and that creates ripples. Ripples are created in the distant mat matter, which alter future and distance events, and then that actually uh, affects the the focal point or the event. So. Now I'm going to actually read from his explanation of this diagram. The being on the left represents a human mind, body, and energy field in a coherent, focused state. And what we're talking about coherent, heart math has done a lot of great research on heart-brain coherence. And what we're talking about you can shift just by your emotional state. They show amazing research. If someone is in, for instance, a state of frustration or a state of anger, and then they move into a state of appreciation or care, it will shift their heart rate variability. It will shift their heart brain coherence. The heart has extends an electromagnetic field eight feet beyond the body. This is coupled with the torsional field. And so this, when we're talking about coherence. We are talking about emotional state as being in a, a, a large part of that. And that is at choice. We are at choice about that. So uh, the energy field in a coherent focus state, it sends torsion waves outward, which couple to the distant matter represented by the large outer circle. This sets up vibrations of the distant matter, which then reflect energy backward in time, which converge on the focal point or event. In Swanson's model, waves propagate backward as well as forward in time. The vibrations can change the conditions of space-time around the focal point, changing the probability of events at that location. Now, Interestingly enough, that CIA paper, if you care to look it up and read it, at the end of it, they are talking about changing the past using human consciousness. It's quite remarkable to read. But when you look into this, the theory of Russian torsion physics, torsion has the capability to change future and past. So if this is not actually just Swanson um, making this point, it actually does come from uh, the Russian tor torsion theory. Now, this is an example of the world of consciousness to affect uh, the field, to affect the vacuum. So Princeton Pair Lab, um, Princeton University, Pair stands for uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research. And there it's a scientific study of consciousness related physical phenomena. So when 9 11 happened, well, let me back up for a second. So they are always studying what's happening in the vacuum that is invisible to us that we, we can. Uh, the properties of the physical vacuum, according to mainstream physics, is that there are random fluctuations in the vacuum. Something called a random event generator is constantly monitoring these random fluctuations in the vacuum. What shouldn't happen, because there is no role of consciousness in mainstream physics, what shouldn't happen is consciousness shouldn't be able to affect those random fluctuations. However, when 9-11 happened and it captivated the, the awareness of the whole world, the shock and amazement of it all, that had a measurable effect on these random event generators and they were no longer random. So that shows us consciousness can affect the vacuum. And so in this particular document, it shows the results show that a substantial increase in structure was correlated with the most intense and widely shared periods of emotional reactions, emotional reactions to the events. Further analysis indicates that, a no, that the non-random behavior cannot be attributed, cannot be attributed to ordinary sources such as electrical disturbances or high levels of mobile phone use. The evidence suggests that the anomalous structure is somehow related to the unusually coherent. So we're all together, we're all unified being freaked out that this 9-11 happened, right? So unusually coherent focus of human attention on these extraordinary events. 
So the Claude Swanson's model relating to the Russian torsion physics, a torsion field can be created, which persists in space or is attached to a physical object. This arises from the pattern of spins, which are imparted to the object. It can also be imparted to space itself based on the patterns of spins in distant matter. Torsion fields can persist virtually indefinitely. And I'm going to be mentioning the cloud of Turin, the burial cloth of Jesus, in a little bit, but you can keep that in mind. There's memory that is left there. These fields can, under the right conditions, persist indefinitely. So the, the Claude Swanson's model, he does point out, just make this disclaimer, that he is not providing a rigorous theory of the role of consciousness, but he's providing some concepts which may be helpful towards the goal of a theory. This is cutting edge stuff. And he asks, how can we create a science which is consistent with all of our prior existing knowledge but also can account for some of these insights, like the role of consciousness with 9-11 and the Trivedi and so forth. And it brings us back to this idea that we know that what we call solid matter, such as atoms, are mostly empty space. They are mostly vacuum within and around us. And the secret, this is the secret to the malleability of reality. This is a diagram from Claude Swanson's book, and he shows here that the vacuum may have many degrees of freedom not included in conventional physics. And there is several different references for that. Um, Tiller has done a lot of work on intention and how that can be imprinted in devices. And then we have Cozy Rev, who is the astrophysicist that really brought us some of the original ideas about torsion physics. But in terms of this diagram, so we have on the far uh, left, mainstream physics assumes the vacuum is random and effects can be neglected. And then in the middle here, Russian researchers and others consider new degrees of freedom in the vacuum. And then on the far right, these patterns constitute new forces such as torsion waves. So the same diagram, here's what um, Swanson's commentary on it. The, vacuums, the vacuum is filled with energy. Usually this energy is assumed to be random as illustrated by the panel on the left of the image. However, it can be organized into various persistent patterns in which case it can have a direct effect on physics. The, this is a huge, uh, there is a huge variety of possible forms of this energy, a few of which are illustrated in this diagram. These excitations of the vacuum may be considered examples of torsion energy. So the diagram that I already showed you from uh, Shipnov, the Russian uh, physicist, the realization that there can be more than one state of the vacuum and that it can actually take on structures and features is a relatively new idea that when we begin to examine the effects of consciousness and how it connects with torsion waves, we find that this may hold the key to contacting higher dimensions. There are many degrees of freedom in the vacuum energy, and this means unexpected forces and phenomena may arise. Now, this is back to the CIA document. And surprisingly enough, they are talking about the absolute here, and they do make reference to divinity. So this is a quote from that um, briefing, and it says, the concept of visible reality, i.e. created world that we see around us, and this is a short uh, excerpt from the paper, but as being the emanation of an omnipotent and omniscient divinity. So that's the CIA classified document. And then just to go further on that same page, they note that consciousness can move into other dimensions outside of space-time. 
And the commander that wrote the article goes on to say, human beings have this form of elevated consciousness, as does the absolute. Our consciousness, therefore, is that differentiated aspect of the universal consciousness, which resides within in the absolute. And when I read this, I couldn't help but think about the father fragment and that father fragment, that thought adjuster being inside us as our connection to the father. So it was interesting to read this in a scientific paper written as, sec as secretive government information so long ago. So both researchers in Russia and the U.S. discuss the absolute in reference to torsion physics, and they actually do talk about it as God creator. As I say, they explicitly state the absolute is a reference to God, the creator. So now I want to just talk about torsion physics and our creator son, Christ Michael. This is the burial cloth of Jesus, which is known as the Shroud of Turin, is the most studied artifact in history. And there has been a lot of debate about it. In uh, a number of years ago, there was a documentary put out called The Fabric of Time, or the secrets of the universe hidden in an ancient cloth. And this image is actually from that documentary. And in that documentary, they interviewed a physicist named Pisik. And one of the things that she, when she, she actually is a, an artist, she creates uh, mon monuments and, and big sculptures and so forth. And she's also a trained physicist. And one thing that she noticed when she looked at the, the Shroud of Turin was that the body was supposedly laying on rock. But the image that she saw, it would be a physical impossibility because there's no distortion on the shroud as a result of him lying on rock. And to be able to conceptualize, understand how could the image that she sees have be create how could it have been created she took her artist mind as well as her scientific mind and she did this rendering of the body in the shroud as she saw it and this is the only way the body could have produced that image basically to find the laws of gravity it being suspended in midair and what this is indicating to us is the effect of torsion physics is going to defy the laws of gravity. It is going to make something like this possible. During the interview recorded in the Fabric of Time documentary, Pizik states that the Shroud of Turin is often viewed as a record of a death, the death of Jesus. However, based on her findings, she shares that it is evidence of a new beginning, a resurrection. She acknowledges that this understanding of the shroud will require a revision to mainstream physics. Pizik adds that researchers have attempted to use science to understand the shroud, but it is the shroud that is helping us to understand science. And if you're able to get a copy of this DVD, which is hard to get actually, what it comes with is 3D glasses. And in order to see the image on the shroud, you actually need 3D glasses. It's a remarkable image. It is a holographic image. And the Taurus energy at the Taurus field and the, holo the nature of a holographic universe all tie in together. That's talked about in the CIA document. That's talked about extensively in the torsion research. So the fact that there was this image that actually shows up now to us today, thousands of years later, as a holographic image. It has a dimensional quality to it. We can't replicate it with our current science. We can't replicate the image on the cloth. So what it is, is it telling us? Now, by the way, I mentioned this in the paper, and it's worth mentioning now, too. I understand that Jesus this is, according to the Rancho book, his adjuster fusion does not replicate our adjuster fusion at baptism. His He was completed with his adjuster and his adjuster left him. So we're not suggesting that 
the act of the resurrection was an, exactly uh, an, adjust, an event of just refusion, but it is providing us some insight into this phenomenon. And the fact that all the research that is available that I've talked about here is showing us that we as human beings can access these states of consciousness. We can access that level of the absolute. It is possible. So even though Jesus is different than us, and we know that, he also has stated in the Bible, and greater things shall you do. So there is the possibility, and definitely by the science, that there is a possibility of could fusion happen on this in, in it's very rare, you know, we know Elijah in the Bible, but do we have the capability for that to happen? You know, I have always thought that light and life was so far in the distant future, it's no possibility that I would ever be able to see it. But when you really understand what they're talking about in the science, it be, you start to question that. Does light and life need to be that far off? Could people really gain this understanding of their consciousness and if enough people gain that understanding could that shift a large number of people into that uh possibility so to end here as discussed the torsion field connects to consciousness and to the absolute the father torsion physics helps us to understand our father fragment and that we can potentially fuse with it during our mortal existence. Okay, thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it. So, Philippe has got a comment. Thank you, Jenny, for that excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I um, have found uh, the way, technically and mathematically, uh, to uh, relate the Higgs boson with the ultimatons and with the neutron proton electron, actually the matter. And you make exact, exactly the link with the conscious. I spoke about our brain, which is made of cells, of course, molecules, but at the end, neutron proton electron. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, if there is a link with the Higgs boson and the neutron, if there is a link with the ultimatons and the neutrons, the protons, the electrons, of course, uh, our brain could be changed in uh, conscious, in soul and spirit. And I used uh, several levels. You, you, you say it, it are planes, but it's exactly the same. I prefer the term of levels because as French, I would not use the, 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 the name of plan or planes because it's a French name. So I, I prefer the other name, uh, more English. But it's thanks, thanks to have uh, the, the, the term of plane, actually. And so it's exactly the same. We have several planes. And uh, this I have uh, more or less discovered. We can discuss maybe with Phil Calabrese uh if you can improve it uh, it would be very very happy if uh, we could do that uh, but uh, i came exactly to the same conclusions as you if we can synchronize because it's a it's a question of, of, of synchronicity if you can synchronize our brain and uh, our soul and spirit we can go till uh, the ultimaton higgs boson level which is another paradise level and if we are at that level of course we are uh, very close to God, and uh, mm -hmm. it is exactly what is written actually in the Urantia book, as I interpreted it. Of course, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Philippe. Uh, I think David Newfer has either a question or a comment. Jenny, I enjoyed your talk, and uh, it really got my attention when I saw the first uh, confidential memo uh, that mentioned. Um, the Gateway Experience, which is yeah. from uh, Robert Monroe's uh, Monroe Institute, which um, I had the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, attend. Uh, oh. I was there like for three three of their weekly week long sessions, and um, uh, I got to talk to uh, some of the people you probably know of, uh, Skip Atwater and Joseph McMonigle and uh, Robert Monroe before he passed away. 
Mm. And uh, so I, I learned a lot there. And that Monroe, the uh, gateway experience is really, I don't know if you've done it, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely worth doing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing I got from that mm -hmm. was uh, an understanding uh, that there's like, this is like news you can use, you know, it's like binaural beats and um, mm -hmm. frequency mm -hmm. following response and listening to tones, uh, which can increase your concentration. And um, mm -hmm. if you're like, you're uh, like encourage, if you want to encourage dreaming and lucid dreaming, uh, there's tones for that. And um, before it was pretty much all, all coming from the Monroe Institute and because uh, they have a lab there and they did a lot of research with um you know the cia and i think joseph mcmonagall he's really a very talented um uh someone who can see other things uh mm. using his uh his i think it's like an inborn talent but they call it remote viewing and they mm -hmm. use certain techniques that they have to follow certain procedures in order mm -hmm. to do the things they do. But I think he was talented anyway. So he was like one of the best at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was even tested like on television, uh, maybe Japanese television where they, mm -hmm. and I think ABC did something too, where they, they, they made it almost impossible to know what they were looking for. They put it in mm -hmm. a sealed envelope and everything, but he could figure out what it was. And uh, because he had such confidence that he could do this, he's really talented. But this, mm -hmm. uh, the frequency following response and the binaural beats, and now it's gone, binaural beats, you need to have headphones. Yeah. But um, the, uh, the uh, now it's called isochronic tones, which um, I don't think you need the headphones. It's just a matter of the vibrations that you entrain your mind to uh, have like higher concentration for study and for um, uh, one, one, I think they're, the, the, story that they uh I, I heard was that there have been um buddhist monks who have attended this gateway experience and you know listened to the tones and they said yeah you can achieve very quickly what it takes years and decades to achieve um mm -hmm. i don't know that is the case but um i know that it's real and i know it's effective and and that you can um go on to youtube and now mm -hmm. some of the most uh, downloaded uh, mm. sites were um, connected to uh, these frequencies because people listen to them every day because they actually mm -hmm. do. They do. I, I find that they do work. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, let me see if I wrote any other, anything else down while you were talking. <laughs> um, yeah, there were a few other things, but I'll let other people. Uh, you know, and so if you had any comments about that kind of thing that that would be good well what i was fascinated i i've typed in remote viewing into the freedom of, freedom of information act and there's a lot that comes up and they've really validated it and it is remarkable to see that average you, you mentioned that someone was gifted i'm sure that there are gifted people but what's been very intriguing to me is that they can teach an average person a process just using their consciousness to be able to access information that there is no way they should be able to know. And they've been able to validate it. And the level of accuracy is phenomenal. And so it is a process that, you know, publicly, I think it's been said, oh, it has been tried by the military and has been, it didn't have failed. But then if you go to the Freedom of Information Act and the statistically, it's statistically validated that it has been proven to work. And it defies what we believe consciousness can really, the possibility of consciousness, but it's not uh, that um, surprising when you look at torsion physics, it, it, it makes sense. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, Linda Lockwood is one of our discussants that has just come on the panel. So Linda, uh, you have a question or a comment? Yes. Uh, this has been very intriguing uh, to me, Jenny. Wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I have I have two questions. I'm going to ask a kind of a two part question. First of all, um, the 
torsion field is like a is is like it's spite you mentioned it's spiraling outside of us uh, and surrounds our body, but it also spirals inside of us. And basically a torus spirals in on itself. So my question is, does it spiral through our chakras as it passes through the body in that diagram that you showed uh, of, the, of the torsion field uh, around us? And uh, that, that would seem to me that that would allow uh, the chakras, which include our, our, our emotions and our, our mental, you know, the different parts of our body, our heart, et cetera, to influence the field. And uh, second, the second question is, uh, uh, you, you mentioned that the, the torsion field is attached to a physical object and suggest. So I wonder about the imprints of the flowers that were found on the Shroud of Turin and whether the torsion field could account for for that, given that it has memory and that it, it suggests that maybe flowers were placed upon the, the body in the tomb, which isn't something mentioned in the Arantia book, by the way. Yeah, so. thank you, Linda. So I didn't mention the flowers in this presentation, um, but I have talked to Linda before and she knew that I had uh, watched that on, on the DVD, The Fabric of Time. One of the things that the researchers found was that there were flowers that are indigenous to Jerusalem at the time Jesus was walking the earth. And they were found imprinted in this holographic form on the shroud as well. Now, in terms of understanding it from torsion physics, the flower itself, the spring flowers are emitting a lot of torsional energy. How that shows up in a holographic form on the shroud who knows, because you're not going to just put flowers on a piece of cloth and it's going to produce the same effect. But obviously it's coupled with the powerful consciousness that Jesus exhibited, which made his torsional field so powerful that the flowers then, the torsion energy of flowers then also imprinted on the cloth as well. But that has been an artifact that has been found and photographed and, and so forth that you can actually see on this DVD. In terms of chakras, I personally have not really investigated a lot of Eastern different philosophies. I'm vaguely familiar with the concept of chakra, but when I started to look at um, Swanson's book and he, what he's trying to do in his book, Life Force, A Scientific Basis, he's trying to bring together a lot of different concepts that are already out there that people are aware of and help us understand them through the lens of science. And they all actually come together through the lens of this torsional physics. So in terms of chakras, there is some information in there. And what he's talking about is, first of all, at the level of the DNA, when the, uh, the, the excitation of the electron happens and the electron moves to another state, there is a photon that is emitted. When the electron moves to another state, it's the spin of the electron that em the spin emits a torsional wave. So almost every time that there is a, um, there is a photon emitted from the DNA, there is almost always a torsional wave. So that is happening throughout the body and really, um, Dr. Maywan Ho has put a lot of information together in terms of the, uh, the body being a quantum um, coherent, um, it, it operates in quantum coherence. In terms of the chakras, those being points in the body where there are vortexes of energy, where this um, field is intensified, where this um, torsional energy is intensified. And I'm vaguely familiar with the Eastern information about rising of Kundalini and so forth. And then it opens the third eye and all of that. In terms of uh, what we're looking at here, you there's something called dimethyltryptamine, which is known as the spirit mo molecule. Dimethyltryptamine is the most powerful psychedelic known to humanity. It can be it's a plant medicine. It can be taken in, uh, made in a lab, but it also is uh, occurs in the brain and body. So it's in the cerebral spinal fluid. It is in the pineal gland, different parts of the brain. What we, what is hypothesized is that is released during physical death. 
to give us a sense of being in another dimensional space. It is released uh, during um, uh, vaginal birth, not a C-section. And uh, that is hypothesized that this happens and it is us entering a different time-space dimension. And so what, hap what can happen in terms of this Eastern philosophy that you your chakras are all vibrating at the right way and then this Kundalini rises and you open your third eye. So what, what makes sense based on this science is that the different chakras have this torsional energy and when they are dynamic enough, robust enough, when the energy is vibrant enough, it, it takes a physiological shift that's quite extreme for the dimethyltryptamine that is resident within us all the time, but not at psychedelic levels, to, to be activated, the endogenous DMT, to be activated at that level, which gives us the experience of being in another dimension. People that have taken DMT external it feels more real than the reality we see with our, our, our eyes. And what we know is the pineal gland has photoreceptors on it, just like the physical eyes. And there are there is research that people have had near-death experiences. They're blind, they have a near-death experience, and then they're able to see. How are they able to see? They're actually, it's their pineal gland that is actually allowing that to be seen. Now that doesn't happen for us in our normal waking reality. Thankfully not. DMT has been linked to schizophrenia. If you, this happens and you're in normal waking reality, psych, psychosis can result. But this is why in a lot of traditions, there's a preparation to enter this heightened state. There's a preparation of the mind and body. You don't just do this without preparation, but when there is preparation and your mind and body is ready to access this heightened state, this is when this torsional energy is generated in the chakras, creating the physiological event that is required to activate the pineal gland and to generate this level of dimethyltryptamine in the body, which will then in, in terms of the Eastern practices, they call this enlightenment, right? Which then you have this experience of being in the world and not out of it, but we can explain that through this scientific um, process. So. Thank you. Yeah. Phil, I think your uh, hand is up. Uh, yes. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, that was very fascinating. I remember one line that says your ancients are, uh, are slow to realize that the, the reactions of reality occur between an act and its consequences. And I think that, uh, you know, that means that there's always something reacting in the universe to what we, we think we are gonna, gonna do. Um, Adam and Eve had a, uh, a way to communicate for a while before they got disrupted through delicate uh, uh, channels in their, in, in their sinuses or their, <clears throat> anyway, something is going on there that made it possible for them to communicate. Uh, the fact that consciousness can change re physical reality is, you know, very uh, a very good thing to to remember because it it says that there is such a thing as choice, a freedom of choice, <clears throat> which a lot of you know psychology, well, physicists and uh, others and think that we're just completely determined. Everything is completely mm -hmm. determined. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I thought might be interesting was that uh, concerning the shroud. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that a lot. And <clears throat> you'll remember that the archangels got control of the body mm. and that they had to bring it out of the, move the, get the body, the, the rock moved so that they could dispose of it rapidly. Mm. And so if they, and you know, if they had to, you know, for instance, when, uh, there's fusion. They have they have mm -hmm. to be raised from into the atmosphere, 
so that they don't burn everything else around. Mm -hmm. So if the archangels zap that body while it was elevated mm -hmm. and we, and the of course they would want to put the shroud there uh, or keep the shroud there so it would have been draping him mm -hmm. the body and then mm -hmm. they had the shroud left so they brought it back and folded it up <laughs> and brought it back into the tomb mm -hmm. so that might explain how it got mm -hmm. uh, the rounded uh uh form interesting yeah that great thought thank you thanks phil okay uh we have uh ken pentland uh he's one of our uh, uh, uh panelists that you haven't met today but this is uh dr ken pentland and uh please ken would you make your comment or your question thank you um excellent talk jenny great job there um, my background is in healthcare, and um, I study different modalities of healing. You mentioned uh, Chinese medicine. Um, I studied acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. In that field, one is preoccupied with properties and movement of subtle energy in the body to prevent and correct disease states. How, in your opinion, does this relate to the field of torsion physics? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the book Life Force, The Scientific Basis, uh, what Claude Swanson is doing, he's looking at concepts such as subtle energy, Chinese medicine, and he's suggesting that ancient people or, you know, what Chinese medicine is around for 6,000 years or something, this this information was known by these practitioners. They're not going to call it the, the torsion physics and what we're calling it today. But listen, they knew it worked. Today, I live in the United States. Acupuncture is covered under health insurance. Acupuncture would not be covered under mainstream health insurance if it didn't work, right? So it works. And we don't necessarily think about the fact that this is working on the meridians of the body. This is working on the energy of the body, but these meridians do relate to this torsional field and the subtle energy he's actually saying is a synonym for um, tor the, the torsion uh, energy. So he's actually showing how in Chinese medicine, these practices, in China are called subtle energy or chi, actually chi, right? In Russia, they're called, it's called torsion physics. It's called torsional energy. So, yeah. Mm, very interesting. In, in traditional Chinese medicine theory, they say that the chi or energy from food in the stomach goes to energize the other abdominal organs. My teacher, when I was in school, explained that this transmission was not solely through conventional digestive process, but more importantly, through biophoton transmission, actually. And since biophotons, you say, are emitted from DNA, what do you think about the role of eating a clean, organic diet in improving biophoton transmission in our bodies? Yeah, thanks. Well, so Mei Wan Ho has done, the biologist that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, She's uh, actually written a book, I believe, on genetically modified um, the whole GMO um, process and talks about how if we understand that we are this electromagnetic field is within us and around us, we understand that when we're altering the food itself, we're also changing the field. And that is interfering with our ability to actually get nourishment from the food. And when a food is organic, you know, think about photosynthesis, think about the plant taking light from the sun, turning it into nourishment. And when we eat that organic plant, we are actually consuming that light. There are, um, there are cases of people in the world that have been documented where they have learned to actually just live on sunlight. And it is documented in the life force, the scientific basis by Claude Swanson, this phenomenon that there are some people that are actually just living on sunlight. So most of us are not going to choose to do that. I mean, food has its own enjoyment that goes along with it. But when you realize that this photonic energy is so vital to our bodies, it's, it's actually, Fritz Albert Pop, Albert Pop said that it is coordinating the biochemical processes 
in the body. So those, those biochemical processes are vital, but, but it's, it's the, the biophotons are at a level before that actually coordinating that to happen. So <clears throat> we do have a question from the audience. Andrea Lozano asks, is there a way to measure the speed of thought such as the effects of prayer? Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what the a person is asking speed of thought, but let's talk about prayer. Okay. And even though that's not specifically talked about in the material that I read, distance healing is talked about. And basically I would suggest that it's the same type of process you are. So when you think about prayer, I grew up Catholic, but when you think about prayer, you think about you're getting into a faithful state and you're, you're, asserting that you're requesting that a certain outcome healing for another person. So that's this intentional sending out of torsional ways. Thought is known to have a torsional nature to it, but it's the intention behind it. And it's the heart centered attention be intention behind it that creates this level of coherence in the field that makes it dynamic. And when we're talking about torsion, unlike biophotons that can't travel very far beyond the body, the, when they're coupled with the torsional waves, there is no limit to how far it can go. You person can be on the other side of the world. There are examples in Swanson's book of people thousands of miles away, but one person meditating on the healing of the other person, and then the other person is having the measurable effects. So for instance, when we think about this as well, what comes to mind is transcendental meditation studies where a group of people it's magnified when you have more than one person right so a group of people using a particular process called transcendental meditation they meditated on peace for a particular crime ridden area and as a result of doing that process the crime rates dropped in that particular location so that has been documented so yeah, this does explain how we can have an effect at a distance. And, you know, she mentioned speed of thought. When you're talking about time, time doesn't actually factor in because this is beyond linear space time. Torsional energy is a level beyond that. So it's instantaneous. So when we're talking, for instance, if you're at the level of consciousness to be able to do the just diffusion, for instance, it's instantaneous because you're beyond time space. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Conrad has got his hand up. Uh, just a few thoughts uh, on uh, paper uh, 111, uh, section one, uh, paragraph two, there's that little statement. There is a cosmic unity in the several mind levels of the universe of uh, universes. Intellectual selves have their origin in the cosmic mind, much as nebulae takes origin in the cosmic energies of universe space. That, that evokes uh, the idea of a vortex uh, of some sort. Another interesting part is we talk about the second midwayers, uh, and they mentioned that they've been electrically activated. Mm -hmm. Now, secondary midwayers are immortal. Their organism doesn't dissolve like our human uh, uh, bodies. That's an interesting uh, part because if they've been sort of electrically activated, there must be something in the fabric of the universe that maintains their integrity yes. over time. Mm. Uh, another part, part that, that, is, uh, that is interesting, and I'll finish with that, when in the, uh, in the um, Morantia spheres, we have to be attuned from one level to another on a regular basis because our consciousness has to be attuned to different levels and we know that there's 500, I think, 76 uh, Morantia transformations awaiting us. And that reminds you uh, the stacks that they talked about in uh, the, those Russian uh, yeah. thinkers. Uh, it, it's a bit, it evokes the idea of the Morantia uh, realities at its various levels in a way. Just, that's, just wanted to point to those 
Thanks. Oh, thank you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, Phil, I'm going to skip over you for just a minute because you've already spoken and we'll come back to you. Gard has got his hand up at the moment. So, Gard, go ahead. Jenny, thank you so much. And, uh, mm. you know, um, again, I teach Asian philosophy. So I've studied the chakras. And, you know, before, he, after he died, Steve Jobs gave everybody a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi which mm -hmm. actually documents so much of what you've been talking about in terms of actual mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. um, and Lao Tzu, chapter 42, said the Tao gives rise to the one, which is the vacuum state, mm -hmm. one gives rise to the two, which is the polarity of energy, the two gives mm -hmm. rise to the three, which is the balancing of those energies, and the mm -hmm. three gives rise to all of reality. So it's, it's 2,500 years ago, sort of a vision of what you've been talking about, my question to you is, what is your daily contemplative practice? How do you contact divine realities in your personal life? Um, so just really simple meditative practice. But you know what this has brought to me beyond that? Because it's because the thing is, it's one thing to sit down and meditate and oh, I'm feeling bliss, bliss, bliss. And then you get in your car. Someone cuts you off and you're screaming and you're, and you just like, it's gone within five minutes. So one of the things that I've realized in this whole process, understanding coherence and states of coherence, it's self emotional self-regulation is key. So can you be in the world and not of it? So can you, instead of going a roller coaster, if something good happens, I feel fantastic. Something bad happens. I feel terrible. It's, being able to, and I'm sure with all your studies of the East, I mean, this is this is something that is so known to you, but uh, when I look at it, I think about heart rate variability and I think about heart math. And I think about how with very simple practices that you don't even need to adopt any philosophy, you can just bring your attention to the pump in your heart, in your chest, your heart, your physical heart, pretend like you're breathing through your heart if you're in a state of frustration or resentment or whatever, bringing to mind something you appreciate, bringing to mind something that you care for, someone that you care for, and just bring that memory into your full focus and immersing that feeling in your body as you're breathing out. Now, this sounds so ridiculously simple, but this is actually one of their protocols that HeartMath has used on veterans of war people suffering from PTSD, anxiety, and so forth. And they can show using a device that clips onto your ear and measures your coherence, they can show a dramatic effect in your coherence. And a lot of it relates to your emotional state. So emotional self-regulation is, is key. Uh, yes, periods of time away in the silence. And I think one of the biggest things issues we have today is we have constant distraction with technology, always vying for our attention. And the only way you access these altered states is to be able to detach your attention for a period of time and not to be constantly consumed, like your attention to be drawn from here to there, but to be able to be self-reflective and to be able to be at peace without any of those kinds of distractions. So thank you for the question. Absolutely. I just returned from Plum Village and Thich Nhat Hanh has a book called Happiness, which has a series of mindfulness exercises. And as you say, it's very simple. If you just learn how to breathe in and breathe out properly to regulate your emotions and it's not complicated science. And in, I think Buddhism is beautiful in the sense that it says eyes mm -hmm. closed. You need to do that for a while, but you also mm -hmm. need to do meditation eyes open, which is mindfulness. So mm -hmm. thank you for your presentation. Uh, I've got a question here from Andy Rodriguez that says, I still believe that the shroud is genuine in the sense that it is a photograph of the body of Jesus. But one detail haunts me. The wound in Jesus' side is on the right side in most paintings from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and, almost, and also on the shroud. But the Urantia book says the wound is on the left. What do you think? 
Oh, golly, I don't, I, I respect the question, but I really don't have any information on that. That's actually information that is interesting. I, I did not know the Urantia book differs in that respect. I did, I wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. I have to yeah. say, I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking along that line either. So we, we both, um, yeah. Um, uh, there's one other, uh, Paul Anderson. Hello, Paul. Uh, what is the difference uh, between a meditative state and a creative state? A meditative state and a creative state? I'm not sure I've ever been thought about that exactly. So when when I think about meditation, I think about turning your, and we just talked about mindfulness with eyes open, mindfulness with eyes closed. Certainly those kinds of things can happen, but it's generally, I think about it in terms of shifting your attention from the external world to an internal focus. And, you know, when such things happen, you're going to have thoughts running through your mind, the internal dialogue is going to happen. And it's allowing those thoughts to be but not getting attached to them. And really, you know, some people in transcendental meditation, I haven't gone through that process, but they use a mantra. People use different processes in, able, in terms of being able to focus their attention and to be able to not be trapped by we this whole task-oriented default mode network part of our brain that's always operating. And when we think about a creative state, when you are in, when you give yourself moments of time to get out of your normal waking consciousness into a heightened state, altered state, that facilitates creativity. So there is uh, work that's being done in plant medicines in terms of accessing heightened states of creativity. And what we know is during that process, the default mode network part of the brain is going offline, so to speak. The blood is being redirected to other parts of the brain and an an interconnectivity is happening in the brain that doesn't normally happen when you're in your task-oriented waking reality. That facilitates brilliant insights, new ideas, uh, novel concepts showing up. I've heard some people say that Nikola Tesla lived almost all the time in that type of altered state and that he had 700 inventions, many that we still use today. And he would actually go into that altered reality, visualize his completed invention in this altered state, complete pure creativity. And then he would then go to work to translate that into concrete reality and make it into physical form. But there is this amazing connection between accessing a state beyond waking consciousness, you know, at times, and that allowing the flow of creative thought that otherwise wouldn't uh, be available to us. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, Phil had another comment that he wanted to make. Um, The shroud would, of course, reverse the uh, side uh, of of the wound. Uh, I hope that's not the issue, because you know, it, if you you know, if you imagine it uh, being laying a lion there, it would uh, have shown. Because now you look at the at it right side, it would look like it's on the left, or or vice versa. Uh, the other thing I thought I, I um, Jenny, do you recall where, uh, or anybody else, where in the Arantia book it says that any person can be conscious or communicate in some sense with any other person, I guess via the personality circuit. There's something in there somewhere, but I would have a hard time uh, finding it. But uh, it basically says we, we can make contact with other persons without, uh, without a, uh, you know, some kind of an intermediary. Um, does anybody remember that? I guess I, not. Would, I, I don't remember that. I know when we were talking about Adam and Eve, absolutely. But if yeah. you, if anyone knows that reference that you're speaking about, I'd love to have it. Yeah. Uh, I'll look for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Ralph, I'm ignoring my, my, my friend, Ralph. Go ahead, Ralph. Uh, just one quick comment, uh, Jenny. 
Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, description of paranormal activity. Uh, I'd like to, and you, you were just talking about um, meditation and so forth, and you talked a great deal about mind consciousness. The Ranchi book in, in several places, about a half a dozen, the concept of the superconscious region of the mind, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, fits very well with our concept of a subconscious. It makes sense that we also have a superconscious. But the interesting point the Urantia book makes is that there's the citadel of the spirit or the citadel of the mind, which both are located in this superconscious region. And uh, I believe that we can proactively uh, shift our, medicaid, our meditative center, as it were, to the superconscious regions at times. And uh, I'm wondering if, if you uh, note any uh, you know, comparison between the effects that the con mind consciousness had on the uh, uh, torsion energy and uh, the, the concept of uh, reaching into the superconscious mind, which it sounds like you were referring to just just in a bit uh, a bit ago, in in that by by doing so, one can tap into uh, a, a source of real energy, creative energy, and so forth, which of course is one of the functions of, of the thought adjuster. Yes, right. Thank you. Well, one of the concepts that um, is comes up in reference to what you're saying is the concept of consciousness not living inside the brain, but consciousness being in the field. Mm -hmm. So Irvin Lasko wrote a book, The Interconnected Universe, and he even uh, conjectured there that even memory does not exist in the brain. It exists in the field. And so along that line, <clears throat> when we're talking about accessing a heightened state we're talking along the lines of what i was talking about in my presentation is accessing not just your own local consciousness but non-local consciousness and th this relates to what i was talking about before so dimethyltryptamine spirit molecule relates to the concept that they've been researching on plant medicines and what people talk about is they're not necessarily just accessing their own subconscious memory. They're actually accessing all of these terms can get, um, there's so many different ways people interpret in terms of science, these different terms, but, but accessing something beyond just your individual self, accessing this field beyond us. And th this relates to Shifnoff's levels of reality, that when we raise our frequency, when we raise our consciousness, we can synchronize. This level is always there. So when people take uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is something we can activate on our own within us, what uh, they talk about is accessing a dimension that is filled with beings. Do you know, three quarters of the people that actually have been in dimethyltryptamine studies were that were atheists before became believers because they were shocked <laughs> that there was something there and they get in touch with, get this, they get in touch with the feeling of unconditional love and they get in touch with the sense that it is, there is beings that are there and the experience people talk about as one of the most significant experiences in their life, up there with the birth of their child, up there with the death of a family member, because it's the first time ever they realize that our waking reality is not all there is. There is much more. And there's just this thin veil that separates us. And when they are given dimethyltryptin, then they can get to it. But the, the important point here is that is resident within us. And that is called a spirit. It's been dubbed the spirit molecule because it is our link to that higher state. So we're not just accessing the local state, we're accessing something that's non-local that's shared with all of us. And the other thing is when people access this state, 
you know, there's a lot of divisiveness in the world today. There's a lot of, you know, I'm different than you, all of this thing. But when you access this state, you have a fundamental visceral experience of the interconnectedness of all of life. You see and feel that what you put out is reverberating back to you. And it fundamentally makes people more caring individuals and makes people have a new sense of purpose and meaning in life. Because where does depression come from? Where does hopelessness come from? It comes from the sense of I'm isolated, I'm separate, I'm different. But when people are given a glimpse of this other reality that is just as 15 seconds away, right? When they take dimethyltryptamine, what they realize is the reality is not as, I, as it seems. We're, we, we are in the illusion, walking in the illusion, like the Matrix movie says. And when we spiritually wake up, mm-hmm. we realize this world is all around us all the time. It is just our perception of that world that is, is, hasn't um, been made available to us. But we have the choice to, to access that. And it, it makes a it's an, it's amazing the number of people that went from atheists to believers as a result of realizing this, that it is there. And they talk about it feeling more real than waking reality. Mm-hmm. So I think that's exactly what a thought adjuster can do for us when, when we give him a chance. I want to thank Jenny and I want to thank uh, both, both Linda and Ken for coming in to be uh, part of our panel also.